I also welcome to Vilnius uh, again. Oh, right? thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, you've come all the way from El Paso, actually, to come to Vilnius, uh, West mm -hmm. Texas. <laughs> quite a long distance and quite a long travel, especially these days. Um, could maybe tell me a little bit about how, how, did you, how did you come to Vilnius in the first place? What's your connection uh, with, the, with the city? Ever. You mean ever? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think there was a, um, hi, it's so great to be here with you guys. Um, I came here, I, it, it's, I keep, no, I know I was here in 2013. There was another year, I have not nailed down what year that was, but I've been here twice before, mm -hmm. and there was a, um, something called the Summer Writers Literary Seminars. I think a, a, a guy um, from Canada ran it, and he had a friend in, in, um, in Vilnius. And so I came, I came for two, two different sprints of like two weeks, mm -hmm. And so got a sense of the place and um, was very happy. And, and met used to, there's a, there was a, um, um, like a kind of a art festival on a Greek island in Nafi mm -hmm. where I met Eusta, um a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so I think That's then... That's sort of the source of things. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and so um, very out of the blue, Eusta wrote me and asked me if I had any interest in Maria Gambutis. And it was so weird because I've, so I've been working on this novel, it's called All My Loves, and it's, 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 the intention is to write a massive work that's bits and pieces. I think after my last then breakup, I, I thought, I'm not just breaking up with this person, I'm breaking up with all yeah. these people. You know, I was looking at a long life of many different, and so I thought, what if I just write about them all, not as one person, but, and so that was, where, where, what I was doing, but I realized that uh, an important piece of that was the fact that when I was 18, I was raped. And that has certainly affected all those relationships in some way. And so I thought, well, I should write a long piece of the novel about, about that experience, but also more largely what the experience of rape is and means culturally. And so I was working on that, and, and there was a piece in The New Yorker that was about this kind of elevated lake in um, the Himalayas that um, somebody was walking around and they mentioned that there were a lot of human remains at the mm. bottom of this lake and first they were, from, for, they were from 200 years ago and who were these people and then there were other remains that were from 2,000 years ago and who were those people and then it, they cut from there, they cut into the genome talking about the genome and saying that we now know so much more about who has ever lived in Europe mm. because of this genome study, and first they mentioned Maria yeah. Magut Magutis. Yeah, oh. yeah Jambutis. Yeah. yeah, I'm going to... It's okay. <laughs> I, I did that. We, I was on a TV interview the other day, and I was like, I just completely blanked on yeah. her name. I was <laughs> like, oh my God, this is very good publicity. Um, but um, they mentioned her and how she had um, conceived of this idea of old Europe being radically mm. changed by the advance of, of tribes coming in from Central Asia and male-dominated tribes and so on, and that that was very popular in the 70s, as you were saying, and then it got debunked, mostly by male anthropologists, who was like, what is this matriarchy, this stuff? Yeah. But now, now that we have the, gen the genome, we can actually say that there authentically was a mass rape event 5,000 years ago that happened, and you can see that the gene pool, it's, it's even a, there's even a piece in the show, I pulled it right off the... This is a long answer to your first question. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> this is good. It says right, right off, you know, one of the wall texts upstairs says, DNA studies of people from this migration wave indicate an intensive intermixing. I'm so interested in the, the euphemisms. An intensive intermixing with yeah. step nomads. For example, in Great Britain, newcomers from the Bell Beaker culture completely replaced the gene pool of the local inhabitants. And so that sounds so casual, like a, like a dating bar, like somehow or other these people were lifted and these people were put in, but it actually means something far more violent than that. And we know it means murder, but it also means mass rape. Yes. You know? mm -hmm. And we talked about this yesterday a little bit, uh, and, and it's been sticking in my head since we met last evening, about the fact that this isn't even a secret or hidden by uh, patriarchal uh, forces from all through the cultural 
uh, push of Europe since the beginning because the, the very concept of Europe, the very uh, myth of Europe is based on rape. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, it's, it, the rape of Europa is absolutely the, the, the point at which this cultural definition is generated, also bring us back to Greece a little bit, mm -hmm. um, and how it's been euphemized or sublimated into the way we describe nationalism or uh, Western Eurocentrism, uh, it's just, it, it, it's just incorporated in it now, and that's sort of like pushed to the side. Um, that it's, uh, uh, yeah, that's just the way it is, and then everything else is a result of that. And to look back on it and address it, this mm -hmm. is something Jambutas is very uh, central to. Yeah, so it's a good, uh, a good inflection point for connection uh, there, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, she suddenly I was like, she seemed deeply interesting. And, mm -hmm. um, and, and, and so, and it, actually, weirdly, I was gonna, I was gonna um, dedicate my, um, novel to my former girlfriend, but now we broke up, and I thought, why not dedicate it to Gambutas? Mm -hmm. So she'll be right at the front of the book. Fantastic. Um, Very good. Uh, so you talk a little bit about the, uh, the relationship you have to these, uh, uh, this specific situation that you encountered about this, tr I think it maybe it's about trust or sort of a understanding of uh, what a non-standardized uh, perspective of science, of archaeology is, and that there wasn't a trust for a very long time. And mm -hmm. the, the immediate reaction to the findings of Jambutis was to reject them or to sort of prove them scientifically against, but now with more data and more uh, uh, a chance to look at it more objectively, maybe not as objectively as these things could be, but uh, to regard them more honestly or more truthfully uh, and that this is an ongoing process. This isn't mm -hmm. like there's not a, an end point of this. It's not like now, oh, it's accepted and everything is fine because we're still struggling with these issues mm -hmm. at, at this moment mm -hmm. <laughs> and in this region and, and, and on the, uh, the frontier of uh, between what is West and what is East, especially. Um, and somehow that's also the, uh, I, I think, well, the genocentrism of the, um, uh, of the uh, historicization that uh, Chimutis is trying to look at with this old European idea, um, it, 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 it counteracts pretty strongly this idea that there is these two poles, that, that actually there's quite a lot more unity and things crossing over between these two, and these things were really arbitrarily constructed. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are not new topics or new things that I'm revealing here, but uh, I think it, it gives us a chance to look back on this and regard uh, some of these uh, issues much more holistically, would you mm -hmm. say? Um, so maybe, uh, it, it, do you have like this, uh, this specific point that you discussed of uh, uh, how the data or the science of, uh, of the genome uh, was presented, uh, how you encountered your first, in, uh, your first uh, relationship to Jambutas. How, how has your perspective changed or how have you uh, maybe also incorporated into your work and like, to the voice of what, uh, what uh, uh, of, uh... Well, you know, I mean, I think it's interesting. I mean, I'm, I'm a poet, mm -hmm. and I'm a novelist, and I'm an art journalist. And what I think is, is interesting is that the more you do, the more it seems like the challenge for the contemporary writer or artist or scientist mm -hmm. is to let all these things intermingle, right. you know? I mean, the idea that, that intuition was not a part of science consistently and always is, is, is to really kind of um, miss how science happens. Mm -hmm. You know, it's always like these eureka moments. It's always, I mean, the most interesting thing that I've ever heard about um, psychotherapy apparently is that the, there's a study, there's, uh, there's something that um, um, they talk about in like music theory and in um, early childhood studies called coanesthesia. Co and what it means is how people... Um, Basically, you know, like there's all that stuff you used to hear about years ago about how child development has so much to do with how much you're held by the mother or the parent early on. Mm -hmm. But also it turns out what you're really affected by is being talked to from different, for the infant to be talked to from different places in the room, mm -hmm. you know, when they're coming into their senses because it's sort of like that's how they create depth perception. And so if nobody talks to you from over yeah. there and over here and over there and then picks you up and keeps talking right. to you and talks to you in a rhythmic, rhythmic way, like apparently babies, if the mother changes the rhythm of how she speaks, they often, they just don't recognize her, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, and so, and what, what they were saying was that a good therapist 
is really good not because of their capacity to analyze what the person is saying, but the capacity to feel what the person is saying that is not at all in the words, that it's absolutely a listening, almost musical, mm -hmm. you know, and it's like, this is like, you know, psychiatry or, or, you know, this is something that we base our sense of the human mind on is this kind of exchange that is not scientific at all, finally, it's mm -hmm. musical, mm -hmm. you know, and so I think the thing that's so great, like, Gambudis, um, basically rating anthropology and saying, no, I not only, I've looked, I've found all these things, I've done this inventory, and now I also intuitively feel this leap that there, there was, this whole area was replaced by something else and there was this something else and it's real and true and to kind of stake her career in that. And I, you know, and I feel that as an artist, that, um, that to invade my fiction with poetry, with facts, with science is, is what we get to do is what is, yes. and is how we get to distribute, you know, knowledge and information in the culture. It's not, mm -hmm. it's not, not my job to talk about um, the genome and mm -hmm. and rape and mm -hmm. um, you know. But to be a flashpoint or to be a lightning rod for, I mean, critique, yes, but also just challenge. Uh, I think this is a this is a characteristic of Nubutus in particular that uh, it was a threat to. Uh, I wouldn't say conservative uh, viewpoints, but also any kind of nationalist viewpoints, even if it was maybe left or, or, or maybe uh -huh. associated with a different uh, political ideology. It wasn't about political ideology, it was about the way that that construct was created and who was threatened by that. And the word threat is really important mm -hmm. because it's really, it's kind of like beautiful and outrageous mm -hmm. that, that uh, female scientists provocative thought that things had been other is, is somehow, yes. is, you know, like brings on anger, brings on almost like violent reactions, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, what, what is being threatened here? Mm -hmm. You know, and it's basically the nature of reality. I mean, like who doesn't know it, whatever gender you are, at some point in time growing up, you were suddenly warned quickly that you weren't to do that. You know, that wasn't who you were. Mm -hmm. And you would be like, why? And they were like, well, that's just the way it is. Mm -hmm. And that's it, you know, that's this kind of large way of, of seeing and holding um, truths in place so that we don't pick it up and say, wait a second, what's under there and yeah. how did this happen? Right. How do we get here? Yes. Um, and there, there, there are a number of efforts. I think also we talked about the exhibition itself and the construction of the exhibition, uh, how it was personified or how these elements or these personal effects were brought into it. Um, maybe as an attempt to make it more human and personal, uh, that you know, just of course is a, is a human being, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, uh, but, but so much was in particular relationship to the womanhood, I guess you could say, or this idea of womanhood. Uh, we talked about the, the, the mirror, uh, that there was somehow uh, uh, indicative of, the, of, of beauty or some suggestion of that, but like that was a, uh, a symbol more than anything else that you wouldn't find necessarily in a male-focused archaeological exhibition. Mm -hmm. And whether, is that good? Is it not good? Personally, I'm not sure. We had a little bit of a uh, discussion about this last night where right. I don't think we came to a, a, real, a real resolution. But uh -huh. uh, it's definitely a different choice than you would find in a typical archaeological yeah. exhibition. I mean, it's a kind of invasion that's more likely to be um, done to a female scientist yeah. than a male one. Mm -hmm. Though I think it does beg the question of why not Invade. I mean, it was so exciting in, in New York when there was a Pollock show, and um, in one of the in one of the wall hangings, they were, there was a piece called Blue Poles that's pretty famous, and they said that Pollock's alcoholism was so bad at that point that his friends had to hold him up mm -hmm. to do this piece. Mm -hmm. You know, and when I saw that, I was like, wow, I have never seen something like that in our museum mm -hmm. before, and mm -hmm. it was really exciting. You mm -hmm. know, and and so I think the fact what's 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 wrong with that treatment, that personal treatment of Gumbudis is what's right with it. Yeah. And it, it, it also advocates for that kind of... Because um, it's a question of what the standard is, right? Like that, if that, again, that, yeah. that's the standard that these things have to be so neutral and kind of without, uh, they're not, not non-gendered is gendered. <laughs> uh, and then that sets a norm which everyone has to operate in relationship to. So there, it invites reactions, it invites experiments and, and trials, one would say, whether they're successful or not depending on who the viewer is. Yeah, and I personally, if I have any passion, it's towards destandardization. I mean, yeah. there's nothing more exciting right. than, than changing the face of a page of literature mm -hmm. of, or a nat the nature of a genre, you know, mm -hmm. or whatever. Yeah, yeah. well, challenge is, uh, yeah, that's uh, critical to, to all these, uh, all these issues uh, and continual challenge. 
I, I don't know, maybe it's, it's uh, how do we, do you feel like this is a good point maybe to... to uh, I, hell on? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know Eileen has something uh, special prepared for us, a, a text that you've not presented publicly before, I believe. Yeah, it's a, it's a virgin, a virgin mm -hmm. text. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is part of uh, a segment of All My Loves yeah. and uh, addresses some of the topics that we've been discussing already. So I'll just give the floor over to Eileen uh, to, to read. Great. Yeah. Thanks. Um. Um. Yeah. So I, um, I've been working on this novel off and on for a few years, and um, and and so this is there's a there's a section called the Cape, and part I mean I was raped on Cape Cod, but also the the Cape is it, it rhymes, and so it's sort of a joke. It's kind of a bad rape joke, but it's 160 pages long, and this is the end of it. Um, so. And I, you know, and I think that you know, like there's so many things. I mean, like I, you know, so I'm really coming in like. Um, it's ongoing, you know what I mean? Like the thing's been going on for uh, like 100 pages already, so there's references that will not make any sense. And so, but I think they're musical enough that it doesn't matter. Though I do think that like, say as a kid, I, I swear, like I grew up in a town with a pond, and I think early on when I was understanding what sex was, I remember there was a story of some teenagers tied a girl up on a tree, and I don't know if they raped her or not, but that was my understanding of what rape was, but also what sex was. You know, I think that it's sort of like the first ways that I ever heard about sex were violent references. And then later on when people explained that that's what your parents do, I was like, how, you know, <laughs> like it was kind of unbelievable. So, um, <clears throat> so that's, and I think I was probably starting, I, I think I started way back 100 pages ago talking about my first attempt to, and, and, and you know, I'm, I'm such a known queer author, and this is, I mean, it's a very heterosexual account of, so I think it's a very queer, queer account <clears throat> of my own early, or somebody like me, because it's, I call it fiction, because I can't continually lie and make up shit as I go along. Um, but um, but it is, very, it, it does start with an account of trying to have sex on Cape Cod later after this rape event. Um, and I just, I love that, that, you know, that the, whatever happened in old Europe is always called an event. You know, the, the word event is so interesting. It's so kind of uncanny. It, it feels like it describes little events and very big ones. Um, so I'll just, I'll just dive. Oh, and, and also, I, I, I'm obsessed with war movies, you know, and that's what I'm talking about at the beginning in a way. Like, there were two movies recently, 19, well, not recently, in the past five years, 1917 and Dunkirk, and they were all made by British and French filmmakers, and they're just the new beautiful version of war. And they just made me crazy, you know? And so that's threaded in here in the beginning. And so and I started studying statistics. Like a lot of, there was one woman in Germany in particular who did a lot of studies, like, well, you know, uncovering how much rape was done by American soldiers in Europe during World War II and World War I, you know? So that's where we're beginning. We're just diving right in. So, Nonetheless, in all circumstances, 5%, so it starts kind of off like a lecture, but we'll wind up in a poem. Nonetheless, in all circumstances, 5% of rapes produce a birth. So back to World War I, if the 1,900 orphans, and that's what they said, there were 1,900 orphans who they believe were probably the offspring of rapes, um, were only half the babies born to rape during that time. I mean, I bet there were many more. Think about the shame attached to these pregnancies. And probably there were some abortions too. 10% of the women in World War II who were raped died, some from suicide and some from the rape itself. Some women were raped as much as 70 times. These were the Russians, but one group's mass rape actually nicely covers another group's simply mundane rape. Orphanages at the time reported 1,900 births from American troops, and these are known rapes. So if you double it, for shame, because shame always minuscules um, things. That makes more like 4,000 such births in the ratio of rapes to birth. And again, I'm using peacetime statistics. It was like peacetime rape statistics. It's an insane thought. Peacetime statistics is 20 to 1. So we're probably looking at 80 to 100,000 rapes that occurred in World War I. There was only one woman in the movie 1917. This is so nuts, right? Um, I am not positive. Um, that she is not a rape victim. But think about it. She is standing in for all of us. Her presence in the film, 
And I like to include men in that us too. I just want to make that clear. Um, her presence in the film spawns the romantic part of the story. She, the only woman, represents the cessation of violence in a war movie. How is that possible? But think how criminal, yes, criminal is the word that is correct, that we get this one romantic story from World War I when the actual history of women in a time of war is that they have their clothes torn off them and at least one soldier, if not many soldiers, violently assault them for their sexual pleasure. That is war. Have you ever seen a war movie with a rape in it? There's a baby in 1917, and the woman says it is not her baby. Whose baby is it? Possibly this is a baby born of rape and abandoned. This is not an orphanage. It's a bombed out building. Is the likely rape implied by the film? We can barely consider it except for the little bit of sorrow we feel for the lost child and the admiration we feel for the young, beautiful woman who is determined to care for the child and not let her die. We know she is not the mother because she has no milk. But sometimes mothers have no milk. Isn't that true? So it's possible she is the mother. She might feel safer saying the child is not hers. But the soldier has milk. Earlier in the story, he was on a farm with his buddy. And in a field, there were a bunch of dead cows and one standing alone moaning. In a barn, there was a bucket full of fresh milk. And the soldier fills his canteen. Later, he gives it to the baby. So the perfect thing happens. Instead of him raping her and killing the baby, I used to watch a lot of war movies with my dad, and I never saw anything like this. The men drank a lot. They died heroically. So war has only gotten better, it seems. More beautiful, nicer, and more tender. War is noble, and rape only happens here. And I'm writing, I was writing this in America, in the suburbs, with sluts. I mean, unless you're talking about someplace like Africa, where there's always war, but that's a less human circ circumstance. And I'm being snide. I'm really focusing on white rape in America or coming out of America. We call it Me Too. Nam was filled with prostitutes. I'm that generation. People I went to high school with went to Vietnam. And that's all I ever heard about, prostitution, or some, that some of those women insert, inserted razor blades in their cunts to hurt our soldiers. I only heard about extreme things women did with their bodies in sex clubs, wild things. I never heard anything men did to them. Prostitution just seemed to be part of war. I heard that story. It was understandable. If you can support an entire family with your pussy, why not? But let's look at World War II. The excesses of the Red Army in Berlin are notorious, but my point being that American soldiers were rapists too. A German book came out in 2015 that stated that there were 190,000 rapes by American soldiers. But after struggling with numbers for several hours, I remember that the crime I'm thinking about is not the 80,000 rapes or the 190,000, nah. It's the invisibility the absence of these rapes from the, I think this is very much the point of why I'm doing, giving this piece here, you know, because it is, it is scary that that piece is so here and so not here in this, in this exhibition. Um, it's the invisibility, the absence of these rapes from the pop, popular consumption of World War II from movies. It's rape by dad, right? About five years ago, a poll was presented that showed that one in five American college age men would rape if they knew that they wouldn't get in trouble. And what gets even weirder is that like, so men were asked if, if would, you, would you force um, yourself sexually on a woman if you wouldn't get caught? And 30% 30, 30 said yes. And then they were asked, would you rape a woman if you couldn't get caught? And 11% said yes. So the thing that's really interesting is it's like forcing yourself sexually on a woman is sort of OK, but rape is not. You know, so it just, again, the word is so loaded. It's, it's so interesting. So why wouldn't dad rape in France and in the UK where he was stationed? Supposedly, my father had a lot of girlfriends. What did that mean? We are open to examining the rapes by Russian soldiers, communists, of Japanese soldiers in Korea. It's their culture. And all that's revealed is that gang rape was part of the solidarity building exercise that armies thrived on. They were underpaid, they were young and horny, and they were excited by esprit de corps. In America, rapes are commonly committed by frat boys and football teams, taking the field, capturing that first adult free space of their lives, the frat house, man-loving land, and man, and incidentally capturing women. When Frank, there's a writer named Frank Wilderson, an African-American writer who's written an amazing book called Afro-Pessimism, talks about the rape of slaves, male and female in America. He describes it as industrial-scale rape. 
which again is, I think, again, what we're talking about in this museum, um, which is, I repeat myself, which is not unlike the subtext of this show. And what that means is that unlike other places in the world where millions of people's lives were stolen and kidnapped and brought to another country or continent or another part of the same continent, Africa, to work in plantations or in mines, in America, maybe only 500,000 slaves were brought here over two centuries, but because they were forced to breed like animals to produce more workers, slaves, it was rape on a scale never before imagined in human history, except in a time of war. Wasn't it a war? No, it was a purchase. No genocide in America, only shopping. What does it mean to enslave people? This is Europe's thing, thing too, to dig deep into the earth and take out gold and diamonds and other precious ores. A pussy's like a mine. That's what's so special about the artifacts in this show. You see these wide thighs and vulva-centric statues. You don't think, hit that moneymaker. It's like awe. But, it, but in this other context, the pussy's like a mine. You want to take stuff, and you just want to kill it and hit it. One of the presidential candidates the other night, and I'm talking about Biden here, our awkward president, was asked about violence against women. And he was adamant that this was a war he cared about. And he said, we just have to hit it and hit it and hit it. And the audience kind of silently gasped, like the wrong feelings were coming up while he was wanting to protect us from other men. In war, 20 rapes will produce one baby. In normal life, without protection, one year of occasional fucking will produce one baby or pregnancy. Just because you haven't been reading this novel for hundreds of pages, um, we're just going to delve into my, or a character very much like me, my own young sex life now. I remember how I didn't use any protection against pregnancy with him. It made sex more like rape. And this is I've written from a context of having already been raped, and then you're having sex with somebody else. And so the way to make it exciting is to not use protection. Um, in terms of my life, 19, I was tied to that tree. Anything could happen. Everything that was not good enough would now be worse. The college I went to that wasn't good enough, that was roughly in the town I grew up in, that kept me living at home with my mother, could be no college. The man I was fucking, who liked me sometimes a lot and liked fucking me when we were both drunk, for sure, so the sex wasn't rape, but he didn't like me that much. He would get a wool shirt, a new wool shirt that he really wanted. And I knew, isn't Vilnius mean, doesn't Vilnius mean wool? I think so. I think the word, is this not true? Okay, well then, just a blurry, a blurry fact I tried to, <laughs> an illusion I tried to make and it didn't work. Um, anyway, he would get a wool shirt that he had really wanted, and I knew all about it, and he would walk into a party I was meeting him at, and as he entered the room where I was standing, I called out his name and I cried with joy, the shirt! And he put on a falsetto tone and cried back, the shirt! And everybody laughed. My joy was pathetic, of course, because his desire, his masculine pride in being decorated and how he was being decorated, in fact, in the watch plaid of his ancestors was something he would confide to me. But if I broke that silence publicly at a party, I would be mocked and punished. He disliked me like that. I needed to be a shadow of his psyche, knowing when I should accent and smile and catch a look that meant that he was thinking this or that, but I was never entitled to act as if our closeness in all its forms and peculiarities could show. It was like a queer relationship. He was fucking a man who enjoyed men's clothes as much as he did, who wanted them for him because they, she, could not have them and enjoyed his dick because they had never seen one before, not really, and had definitely never let one move inside their body, feeling it want and grow and dig. They would clamp their cunt around his dick and he would go, oh. I had always had those muscles in my cunt, but what did I use them for, orgasm? I wanted to destroy him. I wanted to destroy us. I wanted a war. I wanted all my little desires to go to a good college and be away from my family and feel freedom for the first time in my life and to think about the things socially that I did in part already think about and to feel these things growing and changing and shaping a future. I wanted to leave my family and find my world, but feeling that and being close to those things but not close enough always going to home to my house and its sadness and my inability to feel or state my own sadness because I had a place in the plan of the family which was to help and elevate and listen and humor and lighten the load of the sadness of my family. I was like the happy husband. I was, my mother was a widow, so it was a deep, a deep role. I was not far away enough 
so some part of me that feared I would never get what I wanted and feel what I wanted and be with people all the time that wanted to hear what I had inside and hear about the things I had been storing for years, information, theories, pictures, and memories. If that could only partially come out, and if I found myself in a regressive relationship with a man who I would probably like to be or would want to possibly have my own fat dick, I would shove up his ass or his mouth like I tasted his cock and its pissy sweat, and I wanted him to taste that too. He had acne, which is the undoing of many a pretty man. If we get stoned together in his father's car, he was not far from home either, and he hated me for that, for not taking him to the new place, a beautiful, admiring, more radical and confident middle-class female would because he liked me like he liked a guy, I was cool, and he liked sticking his dick in my cunt, but he could not really be in the world with me because I would instinctively out him as being gay and vain. He would rape our intimacy in public. He would mock me for not understanding the closet of a man, and he would refuse to expose our gay relationship. I wanted to destroy us both. I wanted to get pregnant, to destroy my life and his life and be standing in that tiny kitchen, that tiny room, holding a baby, ours, which had ruined both of our lives and brought us to this. Because I intuited that the world was against me, and I wanted to bring it down around us. And that punk gesture, that imagined gesture, made sex very exciting. My whole life was in the balance every time we fucked. I was a gambler with my cunt. I was gambler with my education and dreams and his dreams because he saw himself as walking off into the distance with his guitar, and he left me breathing madly and being some version of Joe and Little Women, her, mad, her marriage to that bearded old dad being the greatest betrayal of all. He left me with the best possible dream for a butch straight girl who liked art and culture and had a body that craved adventure. He put it in the house. So I wanted to destroy him and blow up the house and kill the children. If he was sangu sanguine about erasing my dreams, I could at least be glad to upend his. He would be stuck forever in a middle management job in a department store, drinking too much after work, and I would be standing in the first floor of a three-decker in Somerville, my aunt's house, essentially, and I would be holding a baby, turning round and round like the end of a Bergman movie I loved. This time, the subtitles would thunder, her name was Eileen Miles. And I would stand in that kitchen for hundreds of years, the baby's head growing large and small, my dress growing flowered, my feet, my bare feet, sandals on my feet, Birkenstocks, polio shoes, Doc Martens. I would stand there holding my baby in slips, in punk rock, rock orange silk slips. I would wear cutoffs, tight, short ones in my Birkenstocks. I would be holding my baby and singing. He would be fucking some girl at work that looked like me. I looked like a man holding the baby. I had a beard and I was wearing a kilt and a pair of high top sneakers and tattoos on the calves of my legs. I was singing and humming and smiling at my baby. Behind me, there was a giant window and a tree with red and orange and yellow leaves. It's Harvard College. I'm a faculty wife. I wear a maroon velvet dress and my hair is in braids and I'm holding my baby. Someone leans a mic toward, towards my mouth and I recite a poem by Christina Rossetti. I am holding my baby and murmuring the poem to her while behind me the universe is turning. He said, see where the North Star is and see that star way down there, almost at where you'd imagine the horizon. Well, 15,000 years ago, that star used to be where the North Star is. And I imagined the circle of space turning and turning for thousands of years. I am standing on a hill. I am wearing a piece of old leather and some beads are around my neck and I can feel the cool night air but it is good for the child to be breathing in it. Though he told me not to go out, and I am walking, I am holding, I am rocking my baby. My baby is dead. My baby has been dead for thousands of years. It's my grandmother's baby. It's a baby named Veronica that died so young, but I am holding her in an apartment in Somerville, and my name is Eileen. I was born in Ireland, and the kids are at school. I have so many babies, I can hear the children playing outside in the street. The sounds of their cheers, and the ball hits the ground the sound of them screaming and playing. And I was a baby once. My baby is dead. I'm holding my baby. My baby is smiling and the stars go round. There are children running round and around in circles, boys and girls. I am one of them while I'm holding my baby. I am looking up at my mother's face. I can smell her breath and I don't know what I am, but I am in the air and the things warm around. She is turning around. There are animals around my ankles, cats and otters and roosters and chickens and dogs are running around and tiny mice are running around through the room. 
through the barnyard, across the parking lot, across the street, and horns are honking, and no one can believe I am crossing the street like a crazy person holding my baby. I am sitting on the subway with my baby on my lap and in my arms, and people are smiling at me, and they are smiling at my baby, and I don't know where I am going because I still hate the baby. Hate the baby, hate the baby. Mind, I am looking up at my mother, but I am holding my baby in my mind in the world with buildings rising behind me and around me and buildings coming down and a cannonball smacks a building so hard it collapses. It all collapses, but the baby is sleeping and the clock is ticking and the heat is rising as the machinery clicks and bangs. The baby is in my arms all the time. I am standing in a pot filled with dirt and a plant is beside me and my legs are covered. The dirt is rising and my ankles are covered and now my calves and the dirt is up to my thighs and I cannot allow my baby to be covered and drowned in dirt. I'm climbing and climbing up the side of a mountain while I'm holding my baby. I'm in a mall and people like me are not allowed here. He says, ma'am, move along. I'm sorry, but you can't. And my breast is in my baby's mouth. It feels so weird. And the baby is staring up at me, and I hate that bastard. I hate him so much for fucking me. I woke up from a blackout, and I tried to pretend that this is sex, and this is so real to see me. My friend Eleanor knew him. I saw him running up the stairs like a rabbit. I came out of a dark dream, and I was holding my baby, and maybe it was him. And the heat clangs, and everybody thinks it's fine, it's fine. And I can't let it happen. I said no, and got out of the sleeping bag, and it was night in Brewster State Park, Imagine we're sleeping here in all these trees and swings, practically. And I made it not happen. I stopped it. I stopped it. I stopped it now. It didn't happen. It didn't happen at all. Don't look at me, baby. Get your face, get your baby face away. I am nobody's mother. Rape me 12 times more. You're my kid. Thank you. so much. Um. Uh, I think that gave the room some energy, <laughs> uh, um. and justifiably so. Uh, how about uh, any questions anyone has right now uh, related to the exhibition or to Eileen in general or uh, the relationship of these things? Well, we could just be quiet for or a we moment just, be too, quiet just to kind of, yeah. <laughs> but th I've, never, I've never read that piece before anywhere in the world. It was just very, I, when I thought about, what can I read? What can I read? I was like, oh, go to the end. Yeah. You know? So thank you for letting me read it. Um, thank you. Thank you for, for yeah. bringing it to us. Uh, yeah. So uh, any, any uh, queries from the audience to get us started? Maybe I can start. Oh, please, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. No, no, please jump in. Yeah, please. Um, I have a seemingly random question about the exhibition. <laughs> oh, good. Mm -hmm. And people live lives. And uh, this potential and this energy, which I think for humans is also the ability to see into how we actually can't understand anything about this intuitive being that preceded us, it seems kind of neutralized in that way. And also, when you were speaking about how she is presented as a woman very much, um, for me, like being a local here in Lithuania, it ties a lot into how the country is presented. Huh, huh, but interesting. also being like really disempowered in this patriarchal narrative, 
right. around the country is run. So yeah, if I'm the, I would like you to talk more about if you have any thoughts on that. Huh, God. That's a lot. <laughs> I don't know. I think you just said so much that I'm not sure I know what, you know. I mean, I just, I do, I felt like, to me, the structure of the, the exhibition here allowed me to walk through it and tell myself stories and look at, and look at how the texts were written and, and think about how work, how information was placed in there and how it was not placed. And, and that it's like, it's so interesting that the information is all there, you know, but it's just this, this, very careful way in which certain things are not. Like even we see so many weapons. You know, I, I think, you know, Gamudis was kind of like the big for writing about the Bronze Age, and then she says that I'm, I'm sick of writing about the Bronze Age. I want to go to this non-warlike mm. time, you know, but all the weapons are there as a demonstration of something that happened. There was a kind of violence that occurred, you know, like with those, those various mounds of burial mounds, the ways, you know, people were you know, clearly a whole family was wiped out. Why, by who, how, was that all that, and again, was that all that happened? It was clearly not all that was happened. You know, when you replace a gene pool, something, you know, like, it's just, it's, it, it's amazing that, that there's no repetition. I mean, I'm just repeating myself now. I'm back to my agenda. But, um, so I, I, I enjoyed, I enjoyed the, the show exactly how it is for what it enabled me to kind of claw at, right. you know? But I think it, it just it does beg the question of could there be other presentations that allow this information in? It's like rather than sentimentalizing her as a mm -hmm. woman, mm -hmm. talk about the place of women in history nice. and all these times and what actually occurred. We don't hear about because women's lives per se. That's a code that's necessary uh, to engage archaeology, to engage history, is somehow violence or these violent moments. That's the reference point because that's the way history is written as a series of violent events. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so you have to demonstrate. You have to put the weapons out there. I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I, I can't speak for her. I but the violence to, to women's but bodies cannot be represented. Mm -hmm. You know. I mean, it wasn't until I was born in 1949. This is like so weird. And rape was not considered a war crime until 1949. I mean, like, what the hell? Mm -hmm. You know. I mean, we just like how? I mean, it's, it just seems unbelievable. They were like, oh yeah, I guess that is kind of a you know. Um. Uh, there was an interesting tidbit, which is, I guess, semi-related, that when I was uh, looking a little bit based on a conversation from last night into this myth of Europa, uh, that it's extremely common in Greek mythology to assign the land a women's, woman's name, uh, that the possession of land is somehow directly tied to a female entity. Mm -hmm. And I think that speaks a great deal about the way that these myths and then the myths in which identity and nationality is constructed, particularly in Europe and in the Western world, uh, based on that. If, the, if that is the source point, if that is the reference point, that somehow uh, we associate it with the, the space we possess, that that invites all these other uh, associations. And then the way, again, history is written as a sequence of violent events. Uh, I, I think, you know, I, I look at, I wasn't as familiar with Jambutas uh, before seeing the exhibition, I, I, I knew some, but this was my first major exposure to it. And just the openness of it, that okay, here are the things, and this is my calculation based mm -hmm. on the things. Not because this is what I was told, uh -huh. but this is what I intuited. Right, yeah. right, yeah. I mean, it's almost like this is like my music. Um, yeah. This is what I'm singing to all the information that I've seen, you know? And, 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 and it's interesting, and so like nobody would, if she wasn't singing, nobody would have read her. Mm. You know what I mean? The only reason she's famous is not just because of these, these, all this research she's done, but that she leapt, that she made a theory of it too, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and put it out there as a direct challenge, which invited uh, <laughs> resistance from all mm. sides <laughs> because people were threatened by it. Uh, anybody, yeah, what else? Anybody else want to? More. Kick in something? <laughs> Yes, in the back. I was very much impressed by your reading. Thanks. Um, the way you read and also of course, of course, um, uh, And I wanted to ask you uh, in relation to exhibition, but also with culture in general, um, do you have a feeling uh, that uh, we are coming into a different stage when we finally considering that uh, the histories were different, that the, the, the women were raped and they were abandoned, they were out, like, left unknown and so on. But the, 
even before making a certain um, balance, we come to the situation where already we have to, like, the, the voices come from another side. Well, but we should balance it. We, we should not think about Zinan. Uh, what is Zinan? Uh, mm. There is no such category. Uh, let the food try to nicely balance, and I think that the exhibition, in a way, also this attempt, like, somehow to balance things. Uh -huh. the, the, like, she was writing about the goddess, but of course there were these, like, urban people, like, warriors and so on. But wasn't that so quiet when, at the beginning, she published that God, she was not allowed to put the title goddess of some god. Right. Mm. So then she published, uh, after some time, she, she, she did it. And, like, she was really thinking about, emphasizing that, and now we come in 21st century and let's balance it. Let's be very open and uh, everything. And it's like, um, what do you think about this tendency and, and about, like, really watching this category of, uh, of women, women, and so on? It's like, of course, it's a difficult situation. It's like, the, it might, might sound very essentialistic. But then, if you abandon categories, we lose this political struggle. Right? Mm -hmm. Like, oh, no women, no, no, no one to, to fight anything, fight mm -hmm. Well, I mean, again, again, so much, you know. But I, the part I grabbed onto is the thing about balance, though, because I think it's like it's such a myth. The idea of, there's no such thing as balance in nature, right? It's sort of like I think evolution proceeds erratically. You know, it's sort of like I mean, when we talk about the planet being destroyed, you know, latest the latest you know projections are saying we might have 30 years. I mean, people are actually saying that, you know, because we don't know how quickly. When suddenly there's no ice, the whole, I mean, we've, there's something called snowball earth. Do you ever hear about that? Where it's sort of like they believe that, like, once a certain amount of, of, of you know, weather comes around the planet, it just goes fast. It just wraps around. Like, they think the ice age might have been like that. That it, just, it was really rapid. It was slow, 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 slow. And then, yep. you know, it happens. I mean, but I think that we know that things are like that. It's drip, drip, drip. Again, you know, mm -hmm. it, it, you know, and so I think the idea of social, you know, realities changing and gender realities changing, and trying to like, no, let's just take it slow and like, let's just. I mean, it seems to me that like hyperbole is the natural way to go. You know what I mean? It's sort of like it. But to say to say the unbalanced thing is is great because what it does is it creates space. You know, it's not that it's not that necessarily an, a, a large statement is true or truer. It's just that when you say that, everybody gets all, like suddenly there's something in the room and there's something big to look at, and the room is dif different shaped, mm -hmm. and that's what I think is exciting. You know, mm -hmm. and so the idea to kind of moderate. You know, I mean, even like I mentioned, Me Too. It's just like I find it so that name. You know, it's like Me Too seems so like twee mm. from what we're actually talking about. Mm. You know, it may, it sounds like oh, pathetic girls. You know, it's just sort of like a cute media way of making it sound like something that will pass. You know, and I guess I think that's part of the um, the moderation attempt. You know, we just kind of give something specific language, and then it'll just go away because we get sick of hearing that language over and over again. Because the never the thing has never been explained largely and aggressively and you know with with horns, you know. So much of language is an attempt to diffuse, right? To actually take away the energy uh, mm -hmm. to sort of make it seem smaller or more tangible that it's finished. Like, oh, that ha happened, and now we don't have to talk about it. Anymore. Watch a politician in action ask them a big question, and then the first thing they'll say was. I really like your passion, Eileen. I really hear you. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, like I hear right you. away, they will talk about you as a color or a flavor, and then they'll just they divert yeah. that way. You know, there's sort of a weird way of kind of reluct reflecting, reducing, dismissing. You and know, how standardized that's become. I mean, I hear you has become a really standard uh, uh, response to anyone who doesn't want to actually hear anything anymore. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, like that's the end. You know. Mm hmm. hmm. Uh, more, please. Yes. Look who it is. Yeah. <laughs> uh, My God. I wanted to ask you about yesterday. You said it's the 49th, it's the year when the rape was considered crime, war, war crime. Yeah. And then also it was the year when Maria Gimbuta fled Germany, right? And, and you were born. 
Yeah, and 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 Mikas went to New York. I yes. was like, what the hell happened in 1949? Yeah, yeah. It's very yeah, about very strange. Is there more things that would probably connected to Maria Gimbutas apart from this year and migration and maybe this love for I don't know protecting plants? She she was obsessed with plants. Mm -hmm. Desert Topanga house where it was impossible to grow anything, but she was still trying it. And you were recently uh, fighting for this mm. New York New York City pod, mm. park. Can you tell a little bit? Well, I th yeah, I think I think it is. I mean, I, th I I live in Manhattan in the East Village, and so you know, and Manhattan's an island. So we got these two rivers, and if you look at the West Side, which where the new Whitney Museum is, it's like so built up, it's insane, and there's the high rise, and there's like all these amazing, incredibly crazy, expensive apartments and forms of recreation that are very expensive. And on the east side, what we've had for a long time is this park, East River Park, which is funky and beautiful and wild. The city's sort of abandoned mm -hmm. it, and so then a nonprofit called the Lower East Side Ecology Center just got teams of kids to like, just people who love to grow things. And so it's, it's wild, you know, and there was like an amphitheater there, and you could actually just, you know, get a permit from the city and have a dance party. And it's just been like wild, a, 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 a a movie called Wild Style was shot there like in the 80s. It's like this crazy place. And it's just like, because of environment, you know, because of, you know, like, you know, obviously we've had storms. We had a big hurricane in New York. There was flooding and stuff. And so they were going to have to do something to protect the neighborhood from flooding, you know. And the park, of course, a park is a beautiful, absorbent thing. So, you know, when, when a park is by a river, it just, and there's trees, old trees, it just absorbed all the water, and then the water went back into the river, you know. So they were going to do something to protect the neighborhood, you know, and they were planning, and they, and they did all these things that politicians do and, and city planners do, where they meet people, they meet with the people, and they have workshops, and what do you want, and they have this whole kind of, stakeholders, there's all this particular language and stuff, and they came up with this beautiful plan. And suddenly, out of the blue, the mayor had, you know, hires a new guy, and they're like, wait a second, we've got a better plan. Mm. And it's faster, mm. and, and it's, it's, it's going to like be more thorough, and it will protect the park and the neighborhood. And what, what their plan was to, was to destroy the park. Mm. You know, and it's just basically it's gentrification under mm -hmm. the, I mean, this is happening, I think, all over the world, which mm -hmm. is greenwashing, was like climate resiliency. We can really get some money out of that, yep. you know? And so they decided to basically destroy our park. And, you know, there's like nine, a thousand trees in this park and, um, and just uproot all the trees, the old, among the oldest trees in New York. They destroyed the amphitheater already. There's no amphitheater. It's just flattened. It looked like they bombed it. It's half gone, you know? And so after a year and a half, I just became, I've, I've never, I mean, I've done two political things in my life. I ran for president in 1992. <laughs> and it seemed to be a way, I mean, because it seemed, how could there not be a female candidate? How could there not be a queer candidate or an artist candidate or somebody making less than 50,000, you know? So, and I was doing a certain kind of performance art at the time. And I thought, if I run for president, I'll be, a, I was 39. I was feeling older. I'll be like a young presidential candidate, you know, as opposed to an old poet, you know? And then I can talk about these political issues. And I did it for like, interestingly, I did it for like a year and a half, you know, and it was incredible. And so with this, I just, I, I, I just felt like, you know, this park has meant so much to me. Like I, I stopped drinking alcohol in, in the 80s. And the one thing that saved me was running. Like I thought, oh my God, I have so much energy. I'm crazy. And I would go down to this park. There was a beautiful track there. And I just started running and it mm -hmm. saved my life. And I was like, how could you take this away from all of us? Because yeah. there was so many, you know, barbecues and families down there. And, you know, so it just, I, it, I could not respond, you know. And, and I feel like, I, I feel like, it, but I think it's a real, I mean, the politics of, of um, Gambutas wanting to like, you know, like be surrounded. I mean, some of the most interesting people who work on the environment, like can't stand to even live in cities anymore. They want to live in places like, you know, yeah. where you, you find weird trees and you mm -hmm. grow them here and you just, you create your own, it's like a studio in effect. It's a kind of a natural studio. And I think, and I, for me, I think as a as a city dweller, the natural studio of this park was such a part of my 
existence in my capacity to breathe. And, you know, tree, <laughs> just don't start me on trees. You know, it's sort of like trees invented humans. Mm. You know, there was no air here until there were trees. Mm -hmm. And trees on the planet created the condition of oxygen, you know, that meant that then we could come mm -hmm. and be. And mm -hmm. it, the insanity of, of removing trees from the planet and certainly removing them from urban spaces mm -hmm. is, is, such, is such a violent assault on people's, you know, the, it, the, it's, it is rape. It's rape. It's mm -hmm. rape. It all. Yeah. So it's just you know the, that was that was and remains passionate for me. And, and I just you know I. I um, this is a direct relationship to what's happening here in Vilnius too. I mean, it's in, in many cities where there's a conflict between uh, people who are doing things in the name of green, in the name <laughs> of ecology, yeah. but not. It's only for the data point on the spreadsheet. Uh, or the line that you can use to get votes mm -hmm. rather than actual human relationship to the place or to the subject. Like what you said about having a place that's almost therapeutic. It's a place that actually makes the city live, not just through oxygen, but as a place to be. Uh, and that when you take that away, <laughs> and the, what is there left? And the discourse is always protection. Mm -hmm. The discourse is um, we're making you safe. We're doing this for you. You're vulnerable. Look at, in the, you know, I was a college professor for five years, and I noticed that in department meetings, what pe certain people would do when they wanted to make a point where they would say, well, the graduate students feel, you know, and the graduate students were never in the room. Mm. So there were just this invisible chorus that would be invoked, and it was this way of saying we that wasn't, you didn't have to say we, you would just say, I'm here standing for the, you know, and so it's like our white mayor would stand for the brown people in New York mm -hmm. and say, well, we're helping these poor, vulnerable people of color who live on the Lower East Side, and that we were like these white um, activist fuckers, the tree, fu tree huggers that were just trying to take away from the poor people, you know, and then they, you know, it was just the whole thing was amazing to see how it was manipulated and, and constructed. Um, but it was always for somebody's good. It was always making, protecting some vulnerable other, you know. But just words, you know, only words and not action or, or engagement or experience, right? Mm -hmm. You actually, so I had read. Uh, it's paternalism, always. I, I had read you'd actually written a, an acceptance speech uh, for uh, being elected, uh, which I looked at again. And uh, you talked about the see the, hear the, be the, you mm -hmm. know, this, this actual experience of place that isn't about the, uh, isn't about the way we talk about it, but of actually the way we engage, and that there, we we interface directly with these issues rather than just giving them lip service, which mm -hmm. is you know just the. I mean, everyone says they don't do that, but in the end, most people do, uh, and not going to the park <laughs> and actually just being there mm -hmm. uh, or being with uh, with nature, which is also this. Uh, I think this is something. So uh, I mentioned almost this last night, but the, the fact that. There was so much motive or, or ink spilled, in so to speak, in the last two years about the way, oh, we're re-engaging with our lives. We're re-engaging with ourselves as a humans, as a human level, because we're getting a chance to separate ourselves from uh, the obligation of like whatever the, you know, the, the thrust of modern life is, you know, ec uh, economics. Because of the pandemic? Because of the pandemic, exactly. Yeah. But how quickly it snapped back. Like uh -huh. it, for the first nine months, there was so much writing, even friends and conversations like, oh, it's totally changed. And then as soon as the opening came again <laughs> for the opportunity to kind of go back to the way things were, it did. And, uh, and I see that in the rhetoric, too. I think mm -hmm. you probably, I mean, I, I, do you agree? I, I, I imagine you probably, you probably see it in a similar way. I mean, I, but, I, but I do think this is also a subterranean global breakdown. I mean, I feel like, Everybody, I think, is also in a state of trauma because mm -hmm. there's no feeling that, like, this, you know, the opening, like, this fall was like opening, it's over, mm -hmm. you know, and stuff. And everybody was like, yay. And then, you know, a new version mm -hmm. comes down. And I think nobody has a feeling that this is really over. Mm -hmm. You know, I, everybody has a feeling that this thing could keep, you know, changing until the end of time, until the end of. Humanity. I mean, like I, I. It always has been, hasn't it? I mean, whether it's this particular issue or not. Well, we're, we're always living... doing something mm -hmm. that could completely fuck us up yeah. for good. You know, I mean, or a multiple of things. Yeah, there was an um, uh, article I read of last week about how many times the U.S. accidentally uh, set off its own nuclear weapons uh, in like a 20-year period. There's like 35 incidents <laughs> where huh. it was like within a hair of it just accidentally blowing itself up, <laughs> mm -hmm. and it's uh, a miracle that. You know, the U.S., I mean, just as one example, um, got through that time. And we're always living in 
this, uh, the edge of nothing, I suppose. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, this is just the latest circumstance. Yeah, that's a bit depressing, but yeah. uh, <laughs> uh, more questions. It doesn't have to be a question. Just yeah, there was, uh, something to say. You mentioned this is this writer, Tao, Tao, Tao Lin. Just wonder more about the legacy of Meridian Buddhas. Monk and Buddhist. Why they don't have like an exhibition in, the, in California, some museum? Uh -huh. Monk and Buddhist, come on, it's 100 years. She lived there. She was a professor there. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's almost like a bigger legacy should be there in the US, yeah. right? But, uh, but she's definitely. There isn't exhibition, there is so many mentions, right? And you just kept mentioning names mm -hmm. when you encounter people referring to. Her. But maybe that's how it will happen because it seems like it was so weird. I was, drive I was flying here and I'm reading a novel by a young um, writer named Sh uh, Sean Conroe, a book called Fuck Boy, F U C B O I. And it's, it's really, you know, just a, a new first novel. Um, kind of a dude, but trying not to be a dude mm -hmm. and stuff. And suddenly there's, there she is, there's, there's mm -hmm. Gambudis. I was like, what the hell? <laughs> and he's, you know, and he's, he's quoting this other guy. And I was, I thought, this is so strange. So I, I feel like there's a circulation of ideas that happens and I think it brings things on. So I think it might get to the, weirdly, it might get to the place where you would think it would be more logically later through these strange, unlikely connections, mm -hmm. you know. Um. I wonder if there's, I don't know about like, there's some, if there's some connection with the work the David Graeber's work recently with Girl and Everything, and there's like a more playful view on history as well. Like there's something about, I mean with this I really enjoyed, it's already been said, it's already obvious, but the, the way that she, like she was looking at things in, a, it's like an artist's eye as well, isn't mm. it? Right? Mm -hmm. And there's something like the, also the truth of the complexity of history that's like that's just way more interesting than the way that it's yes. just been generally played out. Mm -hmm. um, I forget not really question. <laughs> no, but I think and I think I think his, people are obsessed with history right now in a way that never before. And even historical novels are interesting in a way that they always seemed like trash. And now I think it's sort of like people are locating their work. In, because you want to be in these other times and absorb something very radical about what happened in another place and, um, and how we're here now. But David Graeber is so, I mean, people are so in love with him and obsessed with him, you know. Yeah, there's something to the fact that, you know, a, a way of looking at history where you just present what's found and not try to uh, base the findings on what came before, but on your own relationship to the material. Again, I think that speaks to direct experience in a way of understanding history and of understanding who we are, where we've all come from, and the complexity of it, that it's not a singular thing. It's not, oh, this is the closed book, this is the end point, but this is an open discussion. That's why we're in the house of history. Yeah. Right, Which right. It's not a singular history. Uh, yeah, yeah. The yeah. Ukrainian book is also <laughs> Good marketing. to be translated into the house of stories. Mm -hmm. huh. The story you is also the scientific you, but also just story, like just storytelling. But in English, I propose to have house of history because it then presupposes that there are all these many histories. It's more Game of Thrones mm -hmm. as a title. Mm -hmm. It's good. <laughs> it's very good. <laughs> what it's like, you know. Yeah, I think that the wrong people doing things is always the right thing, you know? I mean, I just, mm -hmm. a, a friend of mine was, a poet friend was trying to be a paleontologist for a while. And, um, and so she was always telling me interesting things about science. It was amazing. But one of the things she said was that the, because more women were in science now, they were changing the field because one of the tendencies, and this is, you know, I don't mean, I hope this is not an essentialism, but the idea was it's like, women ha were having a tendency to look at phenomena in nature and actually notice what they were doing rather than what they were supposed to be doing. And it turned out that all these things were doing things that nobody had any idea of because there was just, there was less, there was less, less a set idea of what scientific observation was. Yeah. It was just like new people were entering the field mm -hmm. and, and looking wrong. Yeah. You know, and things were doing wrong things. But you don't discover anything unless you do it wrong, right? Like you have to do things wrong so, to break new ground. Nature is clearly wrong, yeah. you know, and, and this has lots to say. Mm. Um. 
Are we there? I think are I we there? Know. We I might be. We, I think yeah. unless we somebody be. has a last cri de coeur. Yeah. yeah. Somebody wants to say something really uh, extravagant and challenging. <laughs> or <laughs> mild and, and or mild and coet. <laughs> but thank you. Well, do you have any idea of when this is going to appear? Which? Oh God! I mean, I think if I, if I stop um, if I stop doing other things, I think it could come out in like two years. You know, because my intention I, I at some point I suddenly I haven't read Nausgaard. I for some reason refused to read Nausgaard. You know, but I thought I want to write like a really big book. Like I want to write a thousand page book. So I've got about seven or I've got about seven or eight hundred pages at this point, and I think I just have to sort of shut up and stop. People ask me to write really interesting things about artists and stuff like that, and it's money, and I like you know. But I think I have to stop doing other gigs and just mm. you know go to Texas and sit down and, and work on it, and just because I think you really have to um, like I'm a poet, and you can be a you can write a poem on the train, you know, and you can just really it's really distract. It was good for me when I was young because. It's just like great for distraction, but it's like writing a novel. It's like being buried alive, you know. You're just kind of like that, you know. And it's but it's fun. It's sort of like great to be in this kind of, you know, because you really have to live in the world of the novel, and and suddenly, and then it just becomes everything is about it, and all things are because that's why the Gambudis our our conversation last summer was so amazing because I felt like I was in this magical place. Look. You know, I, I hear from Yusta, and then suddenly there's this other connect, you know? And it's just like you, you have to be in that magical place for, for the bulk to kind of start making sense and make order. So I, I sort of have to shut up and stay still and mm. I, don't know, I don't know if it feels like, personally, like Calvino talks about this, like the hyper novel mm. that like kind of can hold like the whole world. That's like, a, yeah. Exactly, and I read. I never read. I mean, one of the for me, the the reading part of the pandemic was such a joy. Mm. Like I read Borges for the first time. Mm. I was like, so oh. That, and he talks about Borges in that it's got it's like six. What's it called? It's very good. Six memos for the new millennium. He didn't write the last one because it because he died. Mm. But he talks about Borges, and he, and he talks about Borges as kind of the, for him the like ideal where it's like it's a crystal that is the hyper novel, but mm. in like a short. Uh huh. Uh huh. Like, in, like he makes it into this small thing, but then he also, anyway, he talks about like um, what's it called? Life a user's manual. It's oh. like a 19th century French novel, which is a hundred chapters long. Each chapter is a room in a in a French apartment. Wow, I've heard of that. I never knew what it was even. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. But you read Borges for the first time. Oh my God, that whole yeah. fat book of fictions. Oh. It's so amazing. Mm -hmm. It's so interesting. But it, he's traveling through history. Mm -hmm. You know, and it just, it's so palpable, you know. I mean, those places, and Shakespeare is such a character, and mm -hmm. he's so rich. And I, I think part of it, too, is like there's people, it's the very fashionable writers, right? You go through, like, I was in college in the 60s, so it was Kafka mm -hmm. and Borges, and I had no interest in reading Kafka and Borges, you know? <laughs> and then a few years ago, because I was writing a dog memoir, and, um, and so somebody said, have you read Josephine the Mouse Singer? which is this Kafka story about this mouse opera singer. And I was like, no. And so I read it, and suddenly I was this crazy person going around saying, Kafka's great. <laughs> People are like, who are you? And you just start reading, you, you know? And I was just, and, but, but Borges is like that, too. Mm -hmm. and, you know, it's fine. and I'm finding all the closet Borges readers, too. Um, but though if you meet a South American and say Borges is great, they're like, well, you know, because they've just had him ram down their throats for so long that he's the guy, and nobody wants to hear that. You know. there, yes, please. I just love small books, but uh, I'm glad you're writing big ones. <laughs> but uh, I have a small book uh, for now, and uh, the, the, the oh, thank you. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, that's coming after the Borges uh, statement. <laughs> that's quite a contradiction, but <laughs> yeah. I mean, I just do think you just you, you sort of to to make literature, you have to kind of make a mess mm. and be willing to have ungainly thoughts mm. and have them all lying around and then start to make a new order. Mm. You know, because I think it's always it's sort of like it's it's making a new order that's really exciting. Like I I was brought up Catholic and supposedly um Lucifer was thrown out of heaven because he changed the order of the divine words. Mm. Which I thought, whoa. Mm. You know? So 
I guess that's to make a mess and then make a new order out of it is really great. But you have to waste time to figure out how to do that, I think. Oh, I think we're there. I think yeah, we're there. I think so. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks. you, Eileen, for everything. Thank you. Thank you.